All right, so this is Lara, a.k.a. The Sound Sommelier, here with Supreme LaRock. What's your earliest memory of hip-hop? Uh, for me, seeing it as a teenager, like, uh, actually, I wasn't even a teenager yet. I was about to be a teenager, so uh, I happened to be in New York City, nice. and it was, uh, like, early still so it's almost the birth of hip-hop i mean you know it had been around about 10 years at that point but it was mm -hmm. still early and uh i witnessed it in the streets so probably it just had a really profound impact on you <laughs> oh yeah 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 it was about 80 80 81 something like that mm -hmm. when you went back home to seattle did you kind of seek it out or Definitely. I mean, it blew my mind. I was I was captivated, and uh, I was like, I dove in, basically just dove in. Nice. Um, when you were younger, your home was full of music from Miles Davis, Curtis Mayfield, Elvis, Elton John. But what was it about the Heat Wave and Bozkaz records that your brother would play that attracted your attention? Um, actually, before we get into that, yeah. Uh, my mother had bought me, when I was four years old, she bought me a, a record player, nice. a bunch of records, like these children's records. Like the play school one? Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. They were like oh. Smokey the Bear and these children's <laughs> songs. Nice. Like uh, the Tooth Fairy and, or was it uh, My Two Front Teeth and all this stuff. <laughs> right. But she said I didn't like any of those records that I like just threw them aside and, mm -hmm. I, and I dive into the, her funk 45s. <laughs> nice. She said those were what those were what drew me like that. Those are the records I played. And okay. then so later on, like you just asked me, my older brother, he played Heat Wave. When Heat Wave came out, he played that record like every day. And so I don't know what it was. That I just it just drew me. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess it's soul, right? It's a feeling, and it hits your soul. And right, that's why I call it soul. <laughs> Um, did the music scene in Seattle influence your decision to pursue a career in music? No, not at all. Okay. I didn't even really set out to pursue a career in music. It mm -hmm. was just, I was a, a kid and, you know, I always had bought records. Right. In fact, like the first time I got an allowance, I was five and I asked, can we go to the record store? Because I want to buy a record. <laughs> That's amazing. My son's four. I can't imagine him even knowing half of that. Right. I mean, it was a different time, too. <laughs> right. Um, do you remember the first time you went digging? Yeah, I was in high school, and um, a village voice came out about hip-hop. Nice. I don't know if you remember that issue, but Bam put like a hundred of the, his mm -hmm. favorite breakbeats in it. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember I like that. I think still has it. That weekend, I, I like I asked my mom if she'd take me to the record, drive me to the record store. So I went in with the list because I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna find all these records." Of course, I think I found two of them. Mm -hmm. I remember, it was Baby Huey was one of them, and I don't I don't remember the second one. That's still pretty good if you get two. <laughs> oh yeah, it was pretty good. Like I was young, I didn't know what I had or what I had found. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, which areas do you usually spend the most time with when you go digging? Has that changed over the years? Uh, well, see, that depends on the shop because, okay. uh, you know, when I went digging, I started meeting serious Japanese collectors and they'd come over here and I'd go with them. Mm -hmm. Like I thought I was thorough <laughs> and those guys <laughs> would go through the whole store. And I'd say, like, why are you why are you going through the classical section? And right. they'd explain, well, sometimes the people that work here don't know what they're doing and they file records wrong or people hide records and uh -huh. there could be stuff in here. And so mm -hmm. that clicked in my brain, oh, I need to start looking at everything. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when I started out, I used to just look at black music, like funk. Right. I never thought about rock. I don't I just never crossed my mind to dig in the rock section. And I remember one one day I was going in a shop and this guy was coming out. He had incredible bongo band under his arm. And I stopped him. I said, hey, that, you found that in there? He said, oh, yeah. So where was it? He said it was in the rock section. <laughs> and I was confused, like the rock section. That, I was like, that's a rock record? 
So at that point, I started going through the rock and then jazz and everything. Then I just started going through everything. So sometimes if you go in a shop, they might be lacking in a section. So you're not going to spend a lot of time in that section. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, there's not necessarily a section that I dive into, but I go through the whole the whole shop. That's what you learned. Nice. <laughs> um, on top of the digging, when did collecting records become a priority? Had you already started DJing at that point? No. And that's funny that we say this because I still will say I'm not a collector per se, although, I <laughs> okay. you know, you turn into one. Mm -hmm. I was buying records to dance to. Just I was buying. Right. Kofi, there. That's okay. Have Anyways, him. yeah. So I would just buying records, and then you know, next thing you know, you you have a bunch of records. <laughs> so when I would say oh though, around. Early 90s, 92 is when mm -hmm. I kind of started seeing stuff start to dry up a little. Like okay. you see easy records, like I would say, like uh, things on the Kudu label, which were every, they're a dime a dozen, they're everywhere, and they're in every mm -hmm. thrift store. And then one day I went out and I thought, wow, well, I didn't really see very many Kudu records today. And I You're noticed, oh, up. things are drying up. Let me, uh, mm -hmm. let me start buying things and getting serious. Yeah. I like that. Um, can you share a few that have remained in your collection since the beginning? Um, I mean, all of them. I, there's not like so you a don't really like go there, there, but mm -hmm. um, I won't say all of them. Let me say most of them okay. because I still get rid of things and I trade and mm -hmm. I try to cut the fat and keep what I would like or just keep what I'm going to play or keep something that's sentimental or something that means something to me. I don't want to keep everything because it just be too okay. much. Do you find that you get doubles a lot or more than doubles? Oh, yeah. I used to always. I mean, certain records like Fazo or Giant or mm -hmm. Power Zoo. There's certain records I just ramp. I just always buy it every time I see it because I like the record. Oh, okay. So, I wasn't you know, sure if you, you bought it because you're like, you're do look, I have Yeah, you're looking and then you have like 10 copies of it. You're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you were a member of the Increda crew in the late 80s and had also had a cameo in Sir mix lots video for My Posse's on Broadway. How did these experiences lead to the formation of the Sharpshooters and the and Conception Records label, which you co-founded with DJ SureShot and Strath Shepard in the 90s? Oh, sorry, did you hear my question? Yeah, well, I don't know what's happening with my phone. It keeps... That's okay. A lot of people are using the bandwidth. <laughs> right. Okay, so what, what was the question? Sure. Um, you were a member of the Incredit crew in the late 80s and also had a cameo in Sir mix a -Lot's video for My Posse's on Broadway. How did right. these experiences lead to the formation of the Sharpshooters and the Conception Records label, which you co-founded with DJ SureShot and Strath Shepard in the 90s? Uh, the way I met SureShot was uh, I had heard of him. He was a DJ around town, and I had heard of him, and I heard he was a heavy reggae collector, and I was looking for a reggae record. So I just approached him in the street one day. I said, hey, I introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm looking for this record. I told him what it was. He said, oh, wow, I'm looking for that record too. <laughs> but he said, well, take my number. Maybe we can hook up. And then it happened that I called him, and he lived a, literally a block away. So I walked <laughs> over there, and we hung out all night and played records and traded information. We just hit it <laughs> off. And uh, he told me, you know, a friend of mine's, uh, doing some uh, starting a record label because I told them I produce I've made beats and whatnot and then right. so uh, it was it was like literally the next day after I hung out with him we called this guy we played some beats over the phone and it was Michael McFadden at Ubiquity oh, okay. and he said okay yeah. and he signed us and so we were like well we just made up the sharpshooters mm -hmm. we didn't really know we weren't really a group or knew what we were gonna be and he's like we like to dress sharp and, and we're some cool dudes. We the sharpshooters. I was like, okay, like I'm it. with it. Let's go. <laughs> and then um, from there, I was working at a magazine called The Flavor. And that's where I met oh, Strath. Okay. He was one of the staff members there. And I saw him. I saw his work ethic. And he was serious and he handled his business. And I was like, well, if I'm going to do my thing, I need someone like him on my team. Mm -hmm. What did you do for the magazine? I was a writer. 
I did a lot of, uh, I did some interviews, but I did more so record reviews. Okay. Nice. Um, so artists on conception were well looked after. I read that there was a time when you were dead broke while everyone else involved with the label had full wallets. How did right. that mentality help drive your success? Uh, I just looked at it as if, if I was an artist, right? And I was on a label and I would have certain expectations and the advance I had got from Warner Brothers was for exactly for that, to pay our artists. So I remember that day, I paid mm -hmm. everyone out, paid all our bills, and there was nothing left over. And so everybody was looking okay, and I didn't have anything. And I thought, man, I own the label, and I have nothing. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, because I, I had just bought a new Mercedes at the time. <laughs> and I remember all the artists were like, you only gave us this little bit of money and you, you got a new car. And they thought I was, I don't know, not necessarily getting over, but they thought I had right. more than I had because I didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. And it just, um, it just drove me to keep going, you know. I was mm -hmm. like, it's, my ship will come in someday. Yeah. And it hopefully did. <laughs> or hopefully you think it did. Um, so the con men came together during this time as well. What was your initial reaction when Jake one suggested you release a series of mixtapes? Uh, I met Jake because I used to manage a record store and he'd come in and buy stuff and he knew one of the guys that worked there. He left a beat tape one day. So when I was working one day, the guy was playing this tape in the store. I was like, who made these beats? He said, Jake. I was like, that little, that little kid that comes in here? And he was like, yeah. And so I was like, okay. So next time he came in, we connected. We started hanging out, digging. And at that point, I always made tapes with breaks and samples, grooves, loops. I always made those just for me to listen to. Right. And I didn't think anybody else would want to hear something like that. Who wants to hear four seconds of a song or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then so he's, he was like, well, let's just put some out. Cause we, I made them all the time. Then we started doing, making some together and he'd come over and we just made them all the time. And he was like, well, let's put some out. And we did. And, uh, nice. I guess they, they were a hit. People like them. <laughs> yeah, more, I think more people enjoy those than you think. Or you may have once thought. <clears throat> um, so you've always been a strong supporter of your city. When the first volume of Weedle's Groove was released more than 15 years ago, did you anticipate it would inspire an award-winning documentary, a second volume, a limited edition box set, and a long-awaited reissue? No. <laughs> uh, the funny thing about that is I had already done – I do a lot of reissues. I don't know if people know this. I do a lot of reissues, and um, sometimes my name ain't on it, or so you're not even going to know I'm involved with it. But I was doing a few uh, reissues with Light in the Attic Records. And so they took me to lunch one day, and they said, uh, if you could do any record you wanted to do, what would it be? And I said, oh, I would do this comp of Seattle Soul and Funk. And they looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> they weren't interested at all. And it kind of... It kind of upset me a little bit because I thought, well, you just asked me and I told you, now you're not even trying to hear me, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And I remember I left kind of upset. And I remember saying, like, if I was Kenny Dope or DJ Shadow, you guys would be all over this, you know? Right. And I left and about 20 minutes later, they called me and they, they're <laughs> like, well, let's talk about it. Let's see what you can bring to the table. So we did it. I think it may be, it might have been their best seller to this day. I remember at I one point they too. called me and told me, thank you. We love this record. It's our best seller. <laughs> In the process, so we got all the musicians together to do a, a party, a record release party. Mm -hmm. I remember in the process, I mentioned, are you going to film the party? We can release it on DVD. We can release the performance. And they mm -hmm. kind of giggled, and that was it. It was never talked about. <laughs> and then... <laughs> They called me one day and they said, hey, uh, we're doing this movie and we need you to come down here. I said, who's doing a movie? And then it was the guys, uh, the owner of the label, his girlfriend at the time was going to film school or something. So I guess she needed a project. Oh. Okay. And they, they're like, let's do this documentary on this, on what's happening. And so it took mm -hmm. off, which turned okay. into another box set and a second uh, volume and maybe a third one coming up that I'm working on now. Very nice. Um, the documentary features commentary from fellow Seattle native Quincy Jones. 
Are there other notable Seattle heavyweights who have aided in your growth within the world of hip hop? I mean, all of them, honestly, like uh, Pearl Jam guys and I mean, Kurt Cobain without, honestly, like without, without Nirvana, I might have not ever had a deal with through Sub Pop or through Warner Brothers. Wow. Because it's when they got their deal and they had a lot of money, they mm -hmm. could say, hey, and let's try this or let's do this. So it's like a long chain of, of connections right. in a roundabout manner. Fair. Um, so the first issue of Wax Poetics was published in December 2001 and featured write-ups on Mad Lib, Bobito, David Axelrod, as well as an interview with Cut Chemist and DJ Shadow. What did it mean to be featured in a magazine dedicated to the culture on beat digging? I mean, it was amazing. Um, even to be mentioned along those names or be, you know, beside those names in magazines. And um, and that was a long time ago. <laughs> like, that was a long time ago. And um, I'm still here and still around and still doing it. And I don't know. I guess when you love something, it comes back to you. If you, put, you know, you put your heart into it. Eventually, it works out for you at some point, or you would hope so. Fair. Uh, someone just asked, was gold a big thing all around the Seattle scene or just something Mix-A-Lot was talking about? That was just something he was talking about. My, honestly, like me and him were the only two guys that had gold chains out here. <laughs> Those were some thick chains. <laughs> Um, so you're known as one of the most committed record collectors in the world with an immense collection that totaled around 50,000 more than 10 years ago. Where would you estimate that number is now? Um, I'd say it's about the same. It probably went up to mm -hmm. 70 or 80. Mm -hmm. And then I moved. And then um, it was just too much. And like I said, I got to cut the trim the fat and just keep what I really like or what means something right. to me. So even now, I'm, I'm cutting stuff down. I feel like now, I mean, I'm running out of room, to be honest. I don't have the space. I feel like a lot of people say that that's when they start yeah, so looking at what they have. Something's coming in, something's going out. You need to get a storage unit. <laughs> I, um, had, I had three storage units. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, you've said that when you collect records, you gain a wealth of knowledge that you weren't necessarily looking for. What is one story that has stuck with you that you gained? From? Um, I can't think of any stories off the top of my dome, mm -hmm. but you learn like, oh, Rudy Van Gelder is an engineer and he engineered all the Blue Note records or all the Verve records. And you learn all this other extra stuff right. that you weren't even necessarily trying to learn or Mm -hmm. figure out but you learn it over the years and then it just takes up brain space right. you know you learn weird goofy things or like this guy used to beat his wife or whatever it is whatever the story is mm -hmm. it's great for parties right That's kind of what i think about that um in your interview with alan paz's dust and grooves book which is right there. Uh, you See, mentioned two of your favorite album covers were designed by Basquiat, which have become rarities. When, where did you find those? Because I want them. <laughs> uh, so I had heard Beat Bop when Star Wars came out. Mm -hmm. And I, I fell in love with the song. So, like the second I heard it, I fell in love with the song. Nice. And I don't remember how I found out what it was. We didn't have internet and everything back then. Like, I don't even know, remember how I found out what the song was. But I found out the name of the song, and I went to the record store to buy it. When I bought it, it was on Profile Records. Mm -hmm. So as far as I knew, that was the original record. And um, I was at a record show not too long after that, and there was a, a collector there. And I told him, I was telling him about the song. He says, oh, you need the one with the artwork. And I was like, what are you talking about? He said, there's Basquiat mm -hmm. produced it, and there's one with cover art. And that was kind of pretty early, like right around the time it had been released. So mm -hmm. I started looking, and I actually found it in San Diego. There was a, a record dealer that had it, and I got it off him. So I've had three of them, and I've sold them for a pretty good price. The people here, I have them, so they come and make, make me crazy offers. <laughs> but I, of course, I kept one for myself. Mm-hmm. And then um, 
you know, I'm talking to other collectors and then they're like, oh, well, do you have the ops? Do you have the other cover he did? And so then I found <laughs> out there's like two more, I think. I think there's mm -hmm. four four records covers he did. Nice. Um, so you're also quoted saying that Sade's sound is timeless and every album is great. How excited are you for her six album vinyl box that will be available on October 9th? Yeah, so I saw the... Uh, that like popped up in my feed though, and I got real excited and then I read mm -hmm. about it and it said it's just the re-releasing -re her six albums in a box. Right. Which I already have. So I was at that point I wasn't too excited because I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, they're just gonna remaster and repackage her catalog. So, so you're not like one for packaging? I feel like that's the reason why I want to get it. <laughs> nah, I mean, not exactly. I'm 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 into everything OG. That's how I look at stuff. So I'm like I, I have all that. the originals. I don't need mm -hmm. I don't need it repackaged. I get it. Um so you've also amassed collections of toys, sneakers, posters, sunglasses, and more, but your boombox collection is what caught my attention. Are they all still functioning? Where do you find them all? They are functioning. I usually try not to get one if it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes that's difficult because you're probably not going to see it again. Yeah. And I I find them just digging around at garage sales. Um, I found one at a thrift store before. People's houses. You know, I was like, this is a funny story. I was driving down the street one day and this guy's out working on his car and I happen to glance over and I see a boom box, a big <laughs> one that I've been looking for sitting in his garage <laughs> on the shelf. So I made a U-turn. And I went and I, I was like, sir, do uh, you want to sell this? And he looked kind of sad because he said it was his lovers who had passed away. Mm. But then he said it, it gave him bad memories and he let me he let me have it. Like, not even let me have it, but he sold it to me at a great price. Mm. But it's like That's stories like story. that. Like just, yeah, always. Another story that's funny is we used to have this swap meet out here and I'd go like every weekend to look for records. And mm -hmm. there was a guy there that only sold boom boxes. And he had like hundreds of them. And he had mm -hmm. all of them. And at the time, I didn't buy them. And I remember I would walk by and I wouldn't even look his way because I'd just go <laughs> straight to the records. What year, like what year was that? Was that like a while ago? or That was, yeah, late 80s, early 90s. Okay. Yeah, it was a while ago. But boom boxes hadn't been out of rotation for very long. No, no. They were starting to go out of rotation. Right. That's why I didn't, that's why it was nothing to, to see them there. Like, mm -hmm. okay, great. You know, you see them everywhere. I just think they were probably all dirt cheap and still, you know, brand new in the box. You could have got them. Mm hmm. Um, your next level 3.0 residency in Colombia was inspired by music lovers across the globe going out of their way to build a connection with hip hop's American roots. Do you think the pandemic has expanded the ways in which fans from around the world can access music they've never experienced before? Um, definitely, because everybody's inside. Everybody's on mm -hmm. lockdown, so they have to get online when they get on if you go and you listen to a song and then it suggests another song or you see all these other things on, on the side of the screen and you go down this rabbit hole and if you, you know, depending on how long you spend, you might discover 50 new artists or 50 new mm -hmm. songs from around the world. Very true. Um, what can listeners expect when accessing your channel on Nerve FM? Okay, so my app, initially it was just going to be my mixes. And then I started adding guest DJs. If I, you know, if I think you're hot or you're a dope DJ and I want to put you on, I'm going to ask you, hey, do you mind if I stream one of your mixes? And I'm, so I've added guest DJs. I'm putting um, music from my vault, stuff I produce that never came out, stuff from my label <laughs> that never came out, demos, uh, live shows. So I'm trying to make it very unique, not like anything else. It ain't like Spotify or, or anything else. Right. Very nice. Um, are there any plans to bring back your podcast, Can You Dig It? I'm not sure. That was um, – somebody asked me to do that. He was starting um, the Soundcasting Network, and he had a bunch of podcasts. 
-hmm. he says, you know, you're a pretty big figure in town. I'd like to get you on, blah, 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 blah. I said, okay. So we started doing it. And then um, I stopped for a little while. It was a lot of work. I felt like almost like I was doing all the work, although it was a team of us involved. I was doing all the editing and whatnot. And it's time consuming. And we had, and we still have, tons of shows that haven't came out yet. So I'm working on them. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. Um, he said he'll have his team edit them so I don't have to do so much work. I said, okay, cool, deal. <laughs> and then um, I don't know what, what's going on with it. I gave them, I gave them all the shows and some of them came out and it just kind of stopped. Hmm. But it didn't, but, it, but I realized it stopped when the pandemic hit. We were doing them and then came back to it and it started flowing again mm -hmm. and it stopped with the pandemic hit. So, I mean, now they would, would have the time to edit it, edit the shows, but I don't know what's going on. I haven't talked to them about it. So, well, so, so the answer is, I, can't, I really can't answer that. <laughs> I want to mm -hmm. for sure. But we right, also well, let's have, put that out into the ether. <laughs> we also have 50 shows in the chamber nobody's heard yet. You know what I mean? True. All right. Um, someone else asked, will we ever see an Art Bar Conception Records reunion with Cutfather Supreme, Jake One, etc.? Uh, probably not. <laughs> Who knows the future of what's happening now? Who knows when we, people can get together again in real life? You know, at a nightclub, mm -hmm. it might be another year or longer. And some of us have moved away. Some of us are older. Some of us aren't in great health. So, you know, it'd probably, probably a no. As much as I'd love to see that and love to do it, probably a no. Not 100% a no, but most likely a no. Okay. Um, the original master reel tapes for Beyond a Shadow of a Doubt, a project you produced in 88, were found and will now be released for a third time on October 24th. What significance does this record hold for you? Um, it's actually released for a first time. Oh. Not a third time. Okay. So it... Uh, so it was it never was, actually released. It never came out. Be, okay. It never came out. I guess the parent company, Enigma, was the distributor in the 80s, and they went bankrupt, which mm -hmm. I just found out recently because I didn't know what happened. I know we turned in the masters, and the label's not coming out. We didn't. I didn't. I thought that was it, but now I learned why. Okay. When the when the masters were were recently found, then I got the whole story. And so it's coming out now on on the original label for the first time. Amazing. Um, you teased that a few new projects you've been working on will be available in the fall. Can you share any other details? Well, one of them was Weedle's Groove 3. Weedle's Groove 3 was going to be the rap area, the rap era. Uh -huh. All early rap from early 80s to mid 90s that came out of Seattle, nice. which I've been working on. And it's not easy to get a lot of this stuff, as I'm sure you can imagine. So mm -hmm. I'm bugging people, I'm tracking people down. Nobody has their own songs. You know, I got to dig and find them on my own. Mm -hmm. And then I had about, I had digitized about 500 local songs to go, to weed through, to pick out 16 that I like, or that I feel should be on this thing. Mm -hmm. And then that computer crashed and I lost everything. So oh I had to God. start over. I had to start over from square one, but I'm pretty much wrapping it up now. So I'm going to get all those to light in the attic and then let them do their work. Nice. Well, hopefully that stays together. Yeah. <laughs> um, in a clip from his interview with the Academy of Wealth that you posted in June, Muhammad Ali shares the moment he recognized that everything viewed as good was associated with whiteness and everything bad was black. Why, in your opinion, does this way of thinking still exist since the interview was conducted nearly 50 years ago? Right. That's crazy, right? When you look back at the time. And I did the math. I was like, that can't be right. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> like, I'm listening to all these records from 71, 72, 73, and they're talking about what's happening now. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, really? Nothing's changed in my lifetime? Right. It's still this way? 
It's just crazy to me. But you got to think about, and it's, everything's coming to light right now. I like it. I think it's a great time. It's a weird time. It's a strange time. But it's a, it's history right now. We're part of this. We're all a part of this right now. And it's opening everyone's eyes to, wow, this is really what's happening. Because, you know, if you, if it doesn't happen to you, you don't know it. How would you know it? Right? You're going to think, that doesn't happen. But it does happen. Things do mm -hmm. happen. So it's great to talk about it, get it out there, and, you know, have an open conversation so we can move ahead. But, yeah, if you're – if all that's embedded in your brain, like you said, from 50 years ago or however long it's been, it's almost – like, that's just how it is. Mm -hmm. Right? And then when people point things out and you realize, you're like, oh, hold on a minute. You can take a step back and look at, oh, wow. So, you, you know, we're conditioned. I was going to say, it's almost like we've been desensitized to it. Right. Exactly. Hmm. Well, hopefully that changes soon. Um, Supreme, thank you so much for taking the time. Is there anything else that you want to add or promote that we didn't cover? No, I just want to tell everyone thank you. Um, shout everyone out that's tuning in, that's watching. Thank you for having me on. I'm not thank a you. fan of going live at all. Oh, well, you then know, I really I'm appreciate it. I'm a shy it. guy. I usually don't talk much, and I'm not a fan of going live. But uh, Well, know, I'm doubly appreciate if you're, if you're not following me yet, follow me on Instagram and Definitely check my app out. That's yes. nerve.fm slash Supreme Rock. Well, thank you. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week, and hopefully we hear more from you soon. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.